Hello, my name is Nikolos Kipriotakis and uh, my presentation uh, has the title Beautiful Affordances of Things Around Me, Polyphony and the Bodily Subject. Um, I will show you now the structure of this presentation. Uh, first, we have the prologue, um, which is divided in the following sections, the blind spot of science, utterances and speech acts, suppose or imagine. So, we begin with the blind spot of science. Uh, around us, <clears throat> everywhere, mostly uh, it seems like, uh, like a kind of monophony, not polyphony. The so-called objective, overarching, dominant narrative and method of science. Michel uh, Bitpol uh, often writes that science does not understand itself and it is therefore disoriented, although it grows uh, increasingly efficient from a technological point of view. Um, sciences, in their dream of uh, total knowledge have uh, put the hierarchy of knowledge upside down. They turned their foundation into a secondary byproduct and their constructs into a foundation. For example, they, sub they substituted the mathematical world of idealities for the real world, which is the life world of, of, bond of embodied experience. Science uh, presents itself uh, very optimistic that it can even give an objective ex explanation of what we call the subjective. So, um, but science, Bitpol says, uh, forgets its own methodological trap. It forgets its own blind spot. It forgets the life world and our own situation and situatedness, including our bodies, instruments, methods, present time, etc. So lived, concrete, embodied, situated experience is the blind spot of science. Um, what Michel, Michel, uh, Michel Bitpol says is that how is it possible for science to recover subjective experience from the residual uh, material that was obtained by sub subtracting subjectivity in the first place? How can science recover experienced actuality after having intentionally banished it in favor of pure statements of potentialities or possibilities. Uh, we hope that uh, this uh, discussion, this presentation, will give some motivation towards that direction. Uh, the next section now, utterances and speech acts. So after such a critique, I suppose that we need to proceed slowly and with much care. So the important thing is this. What are the differences that really matter here? I think that uh, philosophical polyphony, even arguments so strong as Husserl's or, or Bitball's regarding the blind spot of science can be rather academic, in my opinion, of course, rather abstract and mild in comparison, and in cases detached from real life. So please forgive me for the word mild, but when it comes to exposure, then everything changes. So, uh, what if we are unfortunate? Uh, if, if we lack authority, if we are the oppressed, uh, the weak, the poor, if we have no voice, no power, if we are the marginalized, the not normal, the monsters, the strangers, the enemies, real or imaginary, then we, might f we may find ourselves in situations where language or utterance as performative speech act, utterance as power, really throws us into a violent interactional field of forces and affects 
of power acting, acted upon us. Language, of course, may, claim, may lay claim to any kind of referential truths, status, meanings, identities, essences, etc. But all in all, what matters to me is that meaning and language or languaging as performative speech acts have tremendous interlocutory effects and implication for those who listen and speak. And some of them may be life-threatening for some of us. So, next section, suppose or imagine. So, can we sense that? Can we sense uh, what it is like to lose our voice, any voice? So, please try this. Uh, suppose we, we were stripped of identities, that we have lost the ability of speaking of the proper names. Suppose or imagine that we didn't own a name, a self, that we were not fixated on subjective attributes or essences. Uh, suppose or imagine that we have even sabotaged, sabotaged language by saying nonsense, laying or staying there or here in this room among other people, maybe in a hospital or, or a clinic for the mentally ill. So try to feel yourself demented. I feel myself like that very often, not only depressed. So try to feel yourselves apraxic, catatonic, bare and naked as just living beings, showing just the signs of life, deprived of individuality or character or social status, without memories, without memories, uh, without narrations of selfhood. Would then there be any person of us, any kind of personhood left in or on that body? How is it to lose identity, personhood? Will I still have a voice? Would my body enact any kind of prehensions, seize in grasping the world and the things around it? And would that count, count as a way of being, being in the world, as a way of having a voice? So being voiceless, would that still count as a voice, a demand, a need? <clears throat> or are we necessarily, inescapably, inviolably bound to live only in the realm of consciousness? Is it as if our suffering, so-called self, after being born, composed, has also taken away with it the greater pro portion of experience, the portion which transcends self? Can we sense that voiceless, bare being, that bare personhood, that bare uh, bodyhood? I will name that portion the unsaid, the implicit, the preverbal, the pre-reflexive, the non-rational as that. Name it as you like, if you sense that it matters. And does it, that, the larger part of reality and experience, have a place in contemporary theory and practice of psychotherapy? Or is it all the way totally abandoned in a state of non-intelligibility for by the scientific stupidity of our age when it comes to matters of the fully blossomed beauty or flesh of life? Does that still have a voice which can count in the power games of institutional and market therapies of today? If I have to answer uh, this question, I would say that actually, rarely, there are some kinds of peculiar, strange voices referring to that, some kinds of voices for the voiceless. But are they, some of them, 
too complicated, <laughs> too much anti-Newtonian, paradoxical, quantum-like, too counterintuitive? Are they like a rare fruit, rare sounds, totally forgotten, which you might only hear in rare, in rare anti-Cartesian dialogues? So voices for the voiceless. Are they non-existent for the common sense? A common sense which is misguided and misinformed by overarching pop, psychultures and subcultures? Main part now. <clears throat> the sections are those, as you can read here. So let's move on to the first um, section. Judy and I. So now uh, we move to the main part. Judy and I were thinking of giving a, wor a workshop around these matters. First, trying on the one hand to sense together with you this voiceless, implicit, larger part of reality and experience. And second, on the other hand, explicitly to utter, to pronounce a few sounds, a few words of these rare voices. So in this way, we would like to call you to, anti to attend to anti-Cartesian felt meanings but not only in an abstract manner, like when following epistemological or philosophical arguments, like beat balls. Uh, no, we wanted to give you a kind of experience of that, specifically regarding the composition and genesis of our perception and experience regarding orientation, regarding the sense of space, the sense of body, uh, whatever that means. Our workshops a workshop had three parts. First, finding our way to the door with closed eyes. Uh, after we wait, of course, for any gnostic image of the room fade away. Uh, second, following the Stratton, Wooster and Scholl experiment. Third, presenting Cartesian and reverse anti-Cartesian notions or models of body and subjectivity. So, um, I, uh, I need to, uh, to um, um, leave this for the, for the moment um, because we don't have um, time. Um, okay, and I will leave also these be because, because this is a presentation, not a, a workshop. Um, yes, of course, and this. Uh, but uh, you can um, take a look uh, of, uh, of this diagram regarding um, or the following diagram regarding Cartesian views of, of the subject. Uh, this is one diagram. We don't have time to explain it and this is a second uh, diagram regarding uh, anti-Cartesian notions of the body and the subject. So we move on to this section. Tell me where the thing that matters is, or um, in different language, tell me where your pain is. So how we could briefly say a few words about what is important uh, here. Um, so it is about um, becoming, it is about difference, uh, it is about process, change, transition. From things with which change, we move to change provisionally grasped as a thing. It is about the cyclical time of, of the body, it is, about, it is about inversions. Uh, to follow Masumi, we, when the relation between space and movement inverts, so does the relation between ourselves and our experience. Experience is no longer in us. We emerge from experience. We do not move through experience. The movement of experience stops with us and no sooner falls back on itself, says Masumi. It is about personhood as the primordial human phenomenon. To, fo uh, phenomenon. to follow Fuchs, nowhere in third-person perspective 
uh, objective description could one find the mindness or the painfulness of my pain, says Fuchs. Uh, it is about affordances of, of things and situations around us, about our situation or situatedness. It is about mutual inclusivity, uh, for example, of the senses. It is about the moving act of composition and recomposition of perception and experience. It is about the full spectrum of experience, the virtual body, the confound, the mixing up of experience. How can we return back to the full spectrum of experience, to the primary fact of the lack of separation of the senses? Is this a, a hypothesis or uh, the larger part uh, of reality? <laughs> it is for you to judge, of course. Is uncluttered, virtual, lived, living body actually embodied experiential spirituality? That is, of course, for you to judge. It is about a gateway opening back onto the formative complexity of experience. Masumi says that while we begin bodily lost in the intensity of the qualitative confound of experience, we might need a, ki a kind of a gateway opening back onto the formative complexity of experience, to the artfulness of the body's self-possession of experience, into the genesis of, per of perception. We might need a new kind of us, of us being bodily lost, a kind of disinhibition. Uh, Masumi says that if the, forma, the normal composition of experience is uh, uh, achieved through inhibition, it stands to reason that the re-intensification of perception is enabled by this inhibition. So we move on to the epilogue. Uh, here we have um, three parts, three, three epilogues. And let's move to the first uh, one. Uh, so it comes to that. All in all, what I have presented here, as I see it, comes to that, to that bare, deprived life, or, from another perspective, to the full spe spectrum of the qualitative confound of experience. It comes to its inhibition and disinhibition. Of course, we are still uh, alive and uh, normally bodily functioning <laughs> and rational. Uh, we may even try at the same time to deny or ignore and forget our own body and its having us, its being us. Of course, we are dressed up with so many identities, traversing different conflicting regimes of truth. But can we still, linguistically and thus explicitly, and more importantly, practically refer to that, to this kind of implicit edge, the non-place, the skin, the boundary, boundary where everything happens, the non-place where we are continually dismantled, unmade, rejecting the premature set settlement, settlement of what we are as persons? And how are we going to do that? Epilogue number two, it comes to inform the common sense, Socrates. For me, this is important, but is it for you? I ask, can we inform, transform the defeated common sense of our time, now turned into public opinion, brooding it with counter fantasies, as Bazano would say, and imagination for the relevant future? Do we refuse to lose confidence in the value of experience, even if experience is difficult to put into wor words, even if it is placed in a position of difficulty by a theory aiming to, to discredit it, as Stengers says? 
Do we want to include all this brave new word of non-dual, anti-Cartesian, bodily subject into what goes without saying into the common sense of psychotherapeutic world? We need an, an anti-Socratic way, a new kind of Socrates, without us, clients, therapists, citizens, etc., being left estranged, excluded, pushed away, expelled, stupefied, convinced of our incapacity to know what we are saying and ready to leave it to any kind of authority to guide us. There is an immensity of things out there and in the, in here, for example, and in here, for example, how psychological transformation, transformation occurs and there is a certain stupidity of scientificity also. Do you agree? We might need, we might need a speak well, zigzag Socrates. So here we end this presentation with this, we might need a speak well Socrates, a new book, a colleague, a group of colleagues, a speak well science or philosophy or critical psychotherapeutic stance, a new Socrates who is willing to find more with us, to make sense in common with us. A symposium like this one might have such a character too. We might need a return to the question about what we actually know. So can we create beautiful affordances of things and situations around us, directly inviting characters and offerings for the disinhibition of the full spectrum of experience. We might need to think in zigzag against the straight line as with Whitehead or Gentling. The straight line encourages us to think our statements refer to facts that correlatively present themselves as isolable. The zigzag entails experimentation going back and forth between the, a conceptual abstraction that aims to bring coherence into existence and a situation that our usual statements make bifurcate. The zigzag gives this situation the power to reclaim its reality as individual concrete fact. So, would then Whitehead, Foucault, Deleuze, Rogers, Gentling, Masumi, Bitball, Fuchs, etc. make a real difference, a difference that matters, right there, implicit in the common sense, or the common psychotherapeutic sense be totally annoyed, as Stenger, as Stenger says? Or is this just a romanticism? Judy and I tried to refer explicitly and sensibly to that, to the implicit that. We searched for a new kind of unity and co coherence of the totalitarianism of reductionist materiality, trying not to lose what we already know, not to lose the presence of experience, searching for or dreaming of the visceral self-enjoyment of existence. So, thank you very much. <laughs> this is all. Thank you very much. <laughs>